Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Poetry. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at a very famous poem by Rudyard Kipling called If. This poem is addressed to his son and it offers a lot of advice on how he can be the best that he can in the world that we, uh, the, in the world that they live in. Um, Rudyard Kipling was um, born in the 19th century, he was actually born in India, although educated in England. Um, and this poem was written um, on the turn. So it was actually written in 1895 and then published in 1910. So it's very much a product of the sort of period that he was living in, which valued a sort of stoic, stiff upper lip. So a lot of the advice that he gives his son and his more general reader is about keeping yourself together in the face of adversity. It's also very much to do with what it is to be a man in the Victorian era. So themes of masculinity run throughout as well, but perhaps it's a different view of what it is to be masculine um, uh, than we have right now in the 21st century. So it does need to be sort of read within the parameters of its context. Without further ado, let's get annotating. The title of this poem is simply if, uh, subordinating connective, if you will. Um, that is uh, the beginning of most of these lines in each of the stanza. Um, but really, the reason why it's called if is that this is a reminder that all of this advice is conditional. He's saying, I hope you might be able to do this. If you are able to do this, then you will um, live a good life, be a good man, or live up to what it is to be a good man. So it is really saying this is the choice of the reader or potentially uh, his son, because that's why he wrote the poem. He was offering this as advice and guidance uh, to his son. I think the fact that there is this hyphen here is a sort of almost like a little dramatic moment of what is to come. So we know that there's going to be a sequence of um, advice, I suppose, um, being given to us based from this. Don't worry about this bit here. This is just where it was published. OK, um, it was written in 1895, but it was only published in 19. 10 okay but we'll talk about that as it comes so let's start off by having a little look at the opening stanza if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you so first off let's just start by reminding ourselves of this direct address he is speaking directly to his son but obviously this has a universal audience as well uh, so it's, it's his son, but it's also the sort of universal reader of the time. Um, you know, the sort of the young aspiring Victorian gentleman, perhaps you might say. If you can keep your head. So this is about being balanced and level headed. So if you can keep yourself together when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. So this is a kind of sense of like the world being against you. So if you can keep yourself calm and together when the world is blaming you for things that aren't your fault. No, we don't get the we don't actually get the, the concluding part of the complex sentence. Uh, we're only getting this subordinating clause here if you can keep your head about when we, we don't get the resolution until right at the end of the poem we just get another suggestion okay so <clears throat> excuse me if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you so this is about self-confidence yeah this is about believing in yourself so even when men doubt you so note that juxtaposition between doubt and trust. So if you can keep your faith in yourself when you're being doubted, but also make allowances for their doubting too. So this is asking you to be uh, empathetic um, and forgiving. Yeah, so, um, oh, sorry, I should have put that down there. Apologies. Um, making allowances for their doubting. So it's asking you to take a middle ground and not blame others for not believing in you believe in yourself but don't blame others for not if you can wait and not be tired by waiting okay so this is about 
patience. You know, so it's the if you the positive and then avoid the negative. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. I like this bit. So it's a recognition that people will tell lies about you. Recognition, sorry. Um, that you will be lied about. However, when it says don't deal in lies, it's don't make it your way of life. So it's like rise above other people's flaws. Don't copy them. Yeah, so rise above. Yeah, you can still see that on the page. And this is a similar idea. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. So rise above um, the flaws of others let's just extend that there so that is both hating and lying and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise so this is about um it's basically saying don't be boastful kipling believed that uh the modern masculine man should be uh modest yeah so this is about being humble and modest now structurally you probably can see that we've got some re repeated structures um, so what we have here is an anaphoric structure i.e anaphora as you hopefully remember is when you repeat uh, a word or phrase at the beginning of a succession of lines so you've got it in the if you if you if you and then you've got or and or okay and you'll notice that this part um of the poem starts with a series of rhyming couplets do you see so you've got you 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 too before moving into um the uh the next uh bc uh bc and we'll look at how that shifts later right let's move on to the next stanza hopefully you can see this Right, this gets a little bit more metaphorical here. There's a little bit more to say in devices. So if you can dream and not make dreams your master. So we've got personification here, making dreams the master. And this is saying, don't give dreams too much power. Yeah, so it's good to dream. Oh, so I'm trying to write dream rather than power. It's good to dream but don't give them so much power that you lose yourself in them likewise if you can think and not make thoughts your aim so this is about needing to take action as well as thinking yeah it's not enough to just think thoughts you need to do as well note the way that we've got parallel structures here Again, with this like hyphen, this pause, it's like the afterthought, dreaming, thinking, both important, but there's a warning in the second part after the hyphen. If you can meet with triumph and disaster, or look at the capitalization. You've also got the fact that these are juxtaposed, yeah, and personified now look at the way that this personification continues by calling them imposters so meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters just the same the fact that they are imposters suggests that both triumph and disaster are both temporary yeah both fleeting so it's basically saying don't get caught up in triumph and disaster yeah don't don't make them rule you because you need to understand that they will disappear both triumph and disaster if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools so this is about endurance so if you can endure or if you can cope so this is about putting up with things to hear your truth twisted by knaves so we've got this metaphor here 
And this is almost like the kind of this idea about like corruption of truth. And this is about manipulation. Oh, crikey. Sorry. I'm going to write that again. Apologies. It's lucky I've got space on this page. Um, to make a trap for fools. So another metaphor here. So this is this is the horrible thing when you've said something that is true and then someone takes your words and twists them around and then uses them to manipulate another person. So again, almost like setting, you know, setting you up for a fall there. Um, note, we've got a little bit of um, alliteration with our T's here, which creates quite a, a sort of harsh sound. Or watch the things you gave your life to. So this is about what you value, the things that you give your life to, broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. So here we've got another metaphor, but this is all about determination and resilience. Yeah, this is saying, you know, if everything that you valued crumbles down, well, you just get back up. And even if you're tired, even if your tools, the things you have that get you going are a bit worn out, you just stoop and you just do it all the same. So, yeah, so the end of this stanza is about resilience. If you can make one heap of all of your winnings, OK, one heap. So notice how sort of dismissive that is in tone. So it's basically like, mm, don't value success too much. Yeah. So don't value your successes too much. And risk it on a turn of pitch and toss. So that's the kind of gambling game. Now, this is interesting because it's like he's sort of saying that it's OK to take risks you know, um, that you should take risks, but when they fail, you still pick yourself up. So take risks and don't worry when you fail. In fact, you never breathe a word, a bit of a dead metaphor there, uh, never breathe a word about your loss. So again, this is about not complaining, Again, still just tying back into this idea about being stoic, which is this central idea about expressing what Victorian stoicism is all about. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. So let's look at this. We've got heart, nerve and sinew. So we've got, um, oh, it's a triad, isn't it? But within that triad, we've got kind of ideas about the physical, but you can take heart as metaphor and it can therefore be emotional as well. So if you can keep going with physically and emotionally, even once you're kind of worn out, even once you're sort of tired, it's it's every part of you. If you can keep going again, this is about resilience and determination. Doesn't matter how tired you are, you keep on plodding. And so hold when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. So again, notice that we've got will capitalized here and obviously personified because it's even giving your will, you know, a direct speech. Note the fact that it is an exclamative. So it's about that energy that that it's like that that part of yourself, the gut in yourself that just goes, no, keep going, keep going. So, yeah, this part is about resilience, even when your kind of body and your mind is starting to fail. OK. Final stanza. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue. Or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. So note how we've got person. Um, sorry, we've got juxtaposition here. So this is about sort of being um, blind to status. Yeah. 
So when you are in crowds, this is like with the common people, yeah. But you know, you you don't get too high. Do you know what I mean? You keep your virtue. Um, and again, talking. This is about learning and sharing and um, sharing wisdom. But you know, you don't get too big headed. Or you can walk with kings, so be with the powerful, um, high status people, nor lose the common touch, so you don't get above yourself. Yeah, so this is about the way that you behave with people of all walks of life. Poor people, rich people. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. I think this is a real shame, this line. I... He's tr he's trying to talk about being independent, yeah. That that you don't you don't take too much stock by either your foes or your friends. Again, note your juxtaposition. So he's basically saying, don't let yourself get emotionally invested in either your enemies or your friends. So, it's, yeah, it, yeah, I, that's a way of putting it. No emotional investment. But I think that's really sad. But again, it's a sign of the times. He wants all men to count with you, so you, you do value others, but not too much, yeah? Like, as in, don't put anyone else sort of ahead, or this is, you know, don't rely on others. And then this is probably the more kind of powerful bit. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Now, the unforgiving minute is a metaphor, yeah? This is a metaphor for life. And if you look at the words minute and 60 seconds, it may mean the same thing, it is about the brevity of life. It is about how short it is. So he's basically saying here, make the most of every second yeah make the most of everything if you can do that ah here we go finally here is the resolution yeah this is the end of the sentence because that's right this poem is one long one long complex sentence we just have been getting subordinate clause after subordinate clause after subordinate clause now, finally, here is the main clause, yeah? Yours is the earth and everything that is in it. Again, note the capitalization. So if you can do all of these things, then, you know, you, you will have everything you want, basically. You will have everything you want, you need or desire. <laughs> and then the addition and... It's like, bonus, <laughs> you'll be a man, my son. Right, okay, note the exclamative, note the kind of sense of emotion and passion, which is funny because obviously this is all about stoicism. Um, you'll be a man, right, capitalised. This is potentially like the ideal man. So this is about, um, you know, Victorian attitudes towards masculinity some people question oh could it mean mankind because it's capitalized i don't think so you know kipling was writing to his son in 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 like the late 19th century early 20th century he's not going to have been worrying about what women should be like i think very much this is about the ideal man masculinity which is all about being super stoic super resilient not getting too emotional and just like keeping on going in the face of struggle and hardship you just keep on keep on keep on it's about being successful even when you're sort of facing defeat this is all about inspiring so does it live up to 21st century kind of values well some parts do some parts don't you know you can have a universal reading of it now but i think at the time he wrote it and at the time it was published in 1910 no he was writing very much to his son and other young men about what it is to be a man okay last little comments on form as always yeah 
Um, so I mentioned before that it starts off with an A, 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 then B, C, B, C. But then you'll notice that it then shifts. So that stands a one. Yeah. And then it's in like once you get into the rhythm of it, it just moves to A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. And then that is um, for stanzas two to four. Uh, it's all written in iambic. Can you see this still? Sorry. Um, it's all written in iambic pentameter. And so really what's going on here is that we've got it sort of upbeat in tone and rhythm. But there is a sort of sense of there being kind of that I, I think it's almost it, it creates a sense of rhetoric. It, it's sort of almost persuasive in rhythm. But that makes sense because obviously he's offering advice. But again, remember that this is all based on the subordinating connective if that creates conditional. He's saying, if you can manage to do all these things, then you'll be a man. But actually, one might argue that what he's suggesting is impossible, that, that those are qualities in a, in a human that are Oh, you couldn't do all of them, not all in one go. So there is a slight negativity here. Again, it's a sense of putting on pressure of what you have to do to be a man. And so that means that if his son or, you know, generally young men can't do these things, then in some way they are not a man, which is a bit of a shame, really. Anyway, that's enough from me. Hope that was useful. Um, if you've got any questions or if you want to challenge any of my interpretations, I'd love to hear your viewpoints. Do just pop them in the, the, common, uh, the comment section and then we can have a good old chin wag. Um, thank you very much. If, this, if you're watching this because you're preparing for your um, IGCSE English Literature exam, then very, very best of luck. Happy revising.